welcome people to lecture th number three audio signal processing and we're going to discuss arithmetic that is mathematics a uh, branch of mathematics and modulation uh, so we're kind of rewinding a bit with this arithmetic typically some people would start with the basics uh, but I was inclined to start with interesting and uh, cool stuff so uh, we're gonna rewind a bit but I won't spend too much time so first thing to clarify potentially is the two ways of arranging uh, signal processors in series or parallel a few uh, worthwhile terms here are inline type modification where a modifier is getting the input signal and the output of the modifier becomes the output signal or when you use a send rather than an insert that is a term for mixers you have an additive style modification which means that the output of the modifier is mixed with the actual input of the modifier in other terms you get the dry signal as well as the wet signal another useful term is cascaded form where you actually have things in series there could be multiple processes in series or parallel form when you mix multiple effects like this great uh, in terms of when and how uh, does uh, does it make difference well i guess you might want to discover that for yourself here is a basic example so if I have the distortion and echo in series, that means that every echoed sound will be distorted. If I have them in parallel, well, what that will mean that the first initial input signal uh, will be distorted and potentially also have the dry, so kind of half distorted, depends on whether echo outputs the dry signal. But all the delayed signals will not be distorted and so forth. Uh, Cool. Now, in terms of the basic math, the main thing, first thing to look at is addition. And in terms of addition, what we get is mixing of the audio signals. Here's a little sketch whereby you have one audio signal, another audio signal. Sorry, this is the other audio signal, A and B. And this is the sum of those signals. Uh, worthwhile highlighting is that what happens is that pairwise every sample value gets summed right so uh, you could actually do this by hand one by one so the first sample here is summed with the first sample over there and you get the first sample here so if you would to have them on top of each other it probably is a bit more um, transparent but that's what happens you actually add values each sample to every other sample and they are between minus one and plus one and that is addition or mixing that's what's going on so if you do this what might happen is that you might get values that run over plus one if their sum is more than one that's what you get and then you have a potential of clipping in audio systems uh, typically the limits before clipping before distortion occurs are minus one to plus one uh, normally inside a signal processing platform you can exceed these limits typically the sound card is the one that will impose clipping beyond these levels um, so one other thing is that it, it's actually quite a challenge if you're coding uh, multiple channels and you want to sum them uh, you might want to use a safe amount of attenuation so they never will clip so if you have 10 channels then you would take a tenth of the amplitude for each channel but if you do that then what will happen is that you play through you play a signal single signal through your uh, mixer and it comes out really soft because then you're kind of weakening all the signals coming in so uh, actually it's it's quite a quite a thing if you for for programmers of uh, daw digital audio workstations okay so uh, briefly about uh, stereo processing uh, in the context of mixing which is probably uh, a simple thing to look at uh, typically what we have is in stereo processing that one control 
controls both channels and typically every process needs to be duplicated for two separate channels in order to keep them separate. If you combine them in any way uh, then you are unlikely to keep the stereo separation uh, whereas typically user controls and otherwise uh, controlled parameters are not necessarily left and right separately and therefore you typically use one parameter value for two different processes something like that happens and then in this case if you're mixing stereo channels well then the two left channels have to mix for the left output the two right ones for the right output and in this case you have again control for input one and for input two so worthwhile uh, looking at these things making sure they're quite clear so addition as i said is typically used for mixing audio rate signals uh, audio signals are typically bipolar means that they go positive and negative and they're typically centered around zero so the average of all the sample values is zero now if you add a unipolar signal to a bipolar signal typically what you do is you induce DC offset so the average value is not zero anymore the signal is not centered around zero and this can be harmful to speakers uh, headphones uh, other other gear which is essentially counting on an AC alternating current signal compared to a DC which is direct current signal uh, many hardware devices will have a DC filtering in them so sometimes you don't have to worry but you can also test this you can send out a fixed value as your audio signal let's say 0 0.1 and look at your speaker cones and if they come out and stand out then you have a DC coupled system throughout which means that there will be no DC filtering uh, likely your system is not DC coupled it really depends uh, Sometimes amplifiers do DC filtering, some sound cards do DC filtering, it really depends. Uh, you can also do the DC filtering yourself, some environments have a, a dedicated DC filter or you can just take a high pass filter at a very low frequency. By the way, high pass filter at very low frequencies is really useful to scoop up the bass and, and create a more s a sense of coherence and to reduce the amount of energy that is going into frequencies that don't contribute to what you hear or at least could negatively contribute to what you hear so i would suggest if you make music you know especially if it's experimental bass heavy stuff have a high pass filter at very low frequencies and experiment with this obviously having a subwoofer to to truly understand what's going on is, is useful uh, on the other hand dc offset can be useful if this in induction of asymmetry is done before nonlinearity, then you change the character of your nonlinearity, which is typically a distortion effect. Uh, and typically, you would increase the amount of even harmonics. So, if you do this just with clipping, if you change the DC offset of your signal before clipping, uh, you should notice that the color of this uh, distortion of this clipping will change. Awesome. Uh, next one up is multiplication, uh, which is used typically for amplitude control or attenuation. But we will look into other uh, things as well. So what we have here is uh, a situation where we multiply a bipolar audio signal with a fixed value. In this case, represented by this dial. And what we do achieve by doing that is amplitude control so typically if you multiply with zero as i said you are multiplying all individual samples with zero therefore all the results are zero therefore you're muting the signal um, if you're multiplying by 0.5 positive values shrink and negative values come closer to zero line as well it's a interesting question whether i should use the terms shrink uh, because technically they become higher uh, but visually I guess we can call that shrinking as well so all the values come closer to zero and this is uh, creating a lower gain if you multiply by one every value is intact 
and evidently if you multiply with a value larger than one you increase the gain so that's what happens with multiplying with a fixed value now uh, what the hell uh, this looks like a bit of an error here uh, so this is from the previous slide um, but we will come to the situation uh, when we multiply with a signal okay so we'll talk about that because that will be part of the modulation okay now the combination of the two basic operations scaling and offsetting or addition and multiplication uh, the other way around uh, gives us what we call range conversion which is the typical application which allows us to change the extent of the signal so typically the range of the signal is uh, defined by the maximum value and the minimum value so the range of audio signals is minus one to plus one uh, but that relates to the actual signals which represent audio and in an audio processing configuration there's there are many other signals uh, which are not necessarily audio, but run at audio rate, kind of uh, control signals, um, different modulator signals, kind of uh, intermediate signals before you produce the audio signal. And they will run in many different ranges. And in fact, in very many scenarios, you would need to convert the range. So here I have a sim simple example. If you uh, multiply by 0.5, this original signal, you get a scaled down version between minus 0.5 and plus 0.5. And then if you add 0.5, you actually get, oh, sorry, that's a different scenario. So this is if you multiply by 0.5, and this is if you just add 0.5. So you see in this case, you're scaling it, you're changing the overall amplitude. And in this case, you're offsetting it. And this is where you induce the DC offset, right? So the average is not around zero anymore. It is around 0.5. Um, Okay, uh, so typically with range conversion, uh, you can do this for an arbitrary target range. Uh, and uh, sometimes people refer to this process uh, as scaling or mapping. Now I would refrain from using those works, words uh, because scaling actually means multiplication and range conversion typically involves offsetting as well and mapping actually means that you just uh, route a signal to a destination uh, and you can have mapping without any range conversion so to stay accurate I would suggest to use this long nevertheless rather accurate term range conversion when you want to refer to changing the extent the minimum and the maximum value of your signal like that. Okay, uh, so typically what you have as a basic approach is a linear range conversion. Uh, and this is a little equation how you do it. Um, in this one you get y which is the output value uh, and how you calculate the output from the input value from the x. Uh, and I have these parameters here, the input range, which is the difference between input maximum and input minimum, the output range, which is the difference between output maximum and output minimum. And then from that, you can calculate your multiplier and you can calculate your adder. And then what you can do is a simple equation whereby you say that the output is x times mul plus add. Uh, which is a simple case, but you can also imagine a system whereby your range limits are dynamically changing, so they're not fixed, in which case maybe for every input value you might have a different uh, range conversion and therefore you need to take into account all these values as, as you proceed, in which case you can use an equation like this which means that every time you run it, you will have the opportunity to have a different range and a different uh, 
set of values here, whereby if you just calculate the multiplier and the adder, you have a more efficient process, but the actual range boundaries are fixed. Uh, so that's your choice. Uh, another thing worth mentioning is that you might want to do your linear scaling based on mean value, the center value, and the variation or the range around the, the center value. Uh, typically for stochastic random processes this is useful. Um, sometimes you don't want to be dialing in minimum and maximum values but you want the value and the variation around that value. Uh, this is an equation. Um, I will not be presenting many practical things here uh, so they will come in the exercises. Uh, probably tomorrow or the day after. Cool, so that's linear and linear means that the proportion of this waveform is, stays the same. Okay, so between the manning, maximum, and minimum and the middle value, so it, it's kind of proportional scaling. And then we have exponential uh, range conversion and a way of inducing curvature, which are two different things. So this is one of those bits that are not necessarily very clear uh, if you're starting up with signals, audio signals. Uh, so the main difference is, I mean in both cases you use exponentiation and one of them is the actual exponential uh, range conversion and the other one is typically just changing the curvature. So let's uh, look at the difference here. The difference is where is the variable and where is the fixed value. So if you have an exponent and your variable is the base and you put it to uh, a, a fixed exponent then you will essentially just be changing curvature uh, whereas if you want a true exponential conversion then what happens is you need your variable to be in the exponent. So this is the bit that I will uh, briefly show you in code just because it's fairly crucial and uh, quite cool. Okay, so uh, let's create an array uh, that has 21 values. It starts... Uh, 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 actually, uh, sorry, let's... Uh, use the series here, slightly more straightforward. So it has 21 values, starts at minus 1, and the step is 0 0.1. And you might guess that that's the array between minus 1 and plus 1, which uh, has all these steps. So in terms of uh, figuring out the range conversion, um, Actually, I should I should better take a unipolar signal. Sorry, so I'll take eleven values from zero to one. Okay, zero to one. Just because taking a negative value in exponentiation makes it slightly more complex, I leave you to explore that. Okay, so if this is my array, uh, what I can do is I can take it to the power of an arbitrary value, so I can square it. And this is what happens. So uh, typically what you get is that the values are lower, but the square of 0 is 0 and the square of 1 remains 1. Okay, so and uh, one of the useful things to do is to use some kind of graphing tool to see the maths of this. Uh, because here you can actually do this, uh, let's just do x times x, which is x squared. So this is your parabola, this is your squaring function, and what you see is that, um, uh, it's been a while, come on, uh, what you see here is that uh, you actually see the relationship between the input, the x, and the output, which is y. So when you say y equals x squared, what you're saying that for every value you will plot its square value. 
And what you see here is that the square of zero is zero, the square of one is one, but the values in between, they are kind of pulled down. Okay, uh, what I can probably do here is just um, superimpose another equation, which is y is x. And now you see the two on top of each other. So actually for all the values, you're getting a slightly lower value. Uh, you are inducing a kind of curvature. So obviously in audio, I'll let you explore that when it makes sense. Uh, and then if you take a higher exponent, uh, let me just uh, see how did this uh, find roots? There should be, I don't use this very frequently, but I believe there was something like a math tool that allows me to uh, 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 new equation from uh, hello can't really find it right now um, is it is it the usual thing if I do a hat yeah I can do the hats so if I do x to the power of three then I get an even deeper curvature. So if I compare this to the x of uh, power of 2, see this is the power of 2 curvature, this is the power of 3 curvature, and I can further increase that uh, 5, 7, uh, and if I go below 1, so if I take 0 0.5, I get the curvature in the different direction. So you see in terms of how negative values behave, it's a bit more complex. I will talk about this, uh, I think next lecture will be on um, nonlinearities because then uh, kind of use some math to process the signal like this. But in terms of range conversion, and or at least in terms of uh, inducing curvature, this is very crucial because you see, whatever you do, uh, I can take 0.2, Whatever I do here, the zero and the one points are fixed. And this is great because uh, the suggestion here is if you want to induce curvature in your signal, what you should do is you should uh, have your range zero to one. Then you can play with the curvature anyhow you like. And then you can do another linear range conversion to the target range. May that be a different one. Right? Because if you want to you know, change the curvature, but your input is between 0.1 and 0.3, and your output is between 100 and 1000, uh, you might get confused with all the math. So uh, my suggestion is get it to range 0 to 1, change the curvature, and then linearly uh, change that. Okay, uh, so we can look at that here as well, a to the power of 0.5. These are the, the square root values, so you see they're all higher than the original linear range. Okay, now the thing is that this is not true exponential uh, range conversion. Uh, this won't work for creating uh, equally distant uh, frequencies, uh, nor it will work for uh, amplitude values like that, because what we do in those situations is we create, we put the variable in the exponent. So you see here I had the variable, the a, as a base to the fixed power. But what I should do is something the other way around where I do to the power of the variable. Uh, and this is actually now a true exponential uh, scaling, there you go, uh, between 1 and 2. So what I can do is, as a matter of comparison, this is the squaring, uh, and I'm just offsetting it to be between 1 and 2, uh, and then I will plot both of those. Would that work in a single graph? I'm not even sure. No, it didn't. Uh, let's keep them separate then. Uh, so that's, oh, that wasn't a good idea, let's see, would that actually work? Nope, still doesn't work. So let's just plot them separately. Um, so this is my squaring, and this is my 
exponential. So you see, they're actually not the same. Because here, obviously, I can take something different. I can try to come close. Let's do um, to the power of uh, 1.7. Looks a bit like this, but it's still not the actual exponentiation. So how do you uh, do exponentiation? Well, obviously, you can play with the uh, maths there, uh, explore the logarithms and all the rest. I won't go into that. I will give you a short and useful recipe. Um, typically, you can think of, uh, let's say I wanted to create these 11 numbers as kind of uh, crossover frequencies. Okay, so what I would do then is uh, so meaning that they're exponentially scaled and uh, cover the audible frequency range. Let's say we want something between 20 and 15k. Okay, so um, sorry, 15k. I said so. What I would do then is find an exponent. Oh, by, by the way, before we go there, let me just demonstrate this or at least verify it because last time I did verify it, it did make sense and uh, uh, hope it does now. So if I take to the power of uh, the variable, 2 to the power of variable, these are the values that I get. But what happens if I take a different base? Okay, let's take a base of 5. Uh, what happened there is that I seem to have a different curvature, but actually my range is uh, different as well. Okay. Uh, and what I seem to have discovered, and now it seems I'm contradicting it, which is great. Uh, keep, keep it open, keep yourself skeptical, uh, verify these things. Uh, I was playing with uh, the exponential range in terms of uh, getting the frequencies right. So let's say I have um, typically, I think, uh, if I take 2 to the power of uh, 4, that's 16. And if I take 2 to the power of uh, 15, that's a bit too much, 14, that's 16k. Okay, so one way of creating um, uh, a set of frequencies, so if we, if we want to uh, take these uh, frequencies, what we can do is take 2 to the power of um, array dot series. Uh, and then uh, let's start, uh, let's take... Uh, 11 values, start at 4, and take a step of uh, 1. Okay, and I get these 11 values from 16 to 16,000, uh, and actually they are equally spaced uh, on an exponential scale. And then if I try to do this with a different base, uh, 4, Okay, then uh, what I need, first of all, is to start at number 2. Okay, so 4 to the power of 2 uh, is 16. Okay, so I'm starting uh, at number 2. And then 4 to the power of 7 is 16.384. So in that case, I will actually have to go by 0.5s. Am I saying this right? If I have this array, uh, yeah, I started to and end up at 7. And if I do both of these, now you see it, they're actually the same arrays. See, this is the 2 to the power of that array, 4 to the power of this array, and these are the exact same values. So this is the message here that actually if you do true exponential range conversion, it doesn't really matter which base you have. Right? That's why it is true exponential conversion. Well, that's a funny statement. Uh, sounds a bit moralistic. Horrible. Horrible stuff. I'll take a sip of tea. Okay, so that's the basic message here. Variable to a fixed power. It's just changing the curvature. You can do whatever 
lovely curvature you need but a fixed value to the power of the variable is the actual exponential conversion okay uh, let's go on with the rest of it then um, here come the decibels okay so another one of those uh, basic math things in signals audio signals that can cause confusion now the main thing to know about decibels is that they are great to express um, a relationship between two numbers that's what they're used for uh, so rather than having a unit you can actually express uh, this relationship without using that unit and this is kind of expression works across scales and what it does it allows you to reason about the order of magnitude in terms of uh, the extent um, so typically we use the DB values to express difference in loudness now loudness is a perceptual phenomenon uh, and there are actual actually more accurate measures of how we perceive loudness but the DB scale is really close to how we perceive loudness uh, and what we are trying to do with this is establish a relationship let's say this is a bit louder so how much louder is a bit louder than soft and a bit louder than loud so these are very kind of difficult to um, fix things but nevertheless, the decibels are a, a way of uh, expressing a relationship, a ratio between values that can work across uh, different um, orders of magnitude and across different domains. So the equation here is that to get a dB value, you take the 20 times the log, of the tenth log of the linear value and inverse that in order to get a linear value from db you take 10 to the power of the db value by 20. okay so let's look at this in a basic uh, 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 whatever scenario so you might know it's a riddle if you halve the amplitude okay how many db is that so i would take the log 10 of 0.5 and divide that by 20 sorry multiply that by 20 uh, and you get minus 6 db almost okay and then if you want to uh, work it the other way around what you do is uh, sneak 10 10 to the power of uh, let's take minus 6 now and then by 20 okay and I get something like 0.5 okay uh, now in this case I'm working with just a single value here but actually this expresses a ratio between two values because uh, what I said is if I half the amplitude so halving the amplitude is ratio 1 over 2 it's 0.5 okay so that's a basic uh, you know uh, uh, approach to this and then you can figure out okay what is the ratio if I want to uh, half that amplitude so actually if I want to double the decrease in amplitude minus 12 dB is 0.25 minus 18 dB and so on now uh, that's all fine and well uh, obviously in uh, audio dBs are used in many different ways you have uh, a weighted dB dBA you have dB SPL so regardless of what you're measuring, you can express the ratio or the relationship of a measured value to a reference using dBs. Um, and actually there is a bit where you use uh, power units, where you do 10 instead of 20. I won't go into that. But I would, what I would like to show you is this, is this uh, lovely little example whereby I calculate the age difference in dB okay and that might show you how this is actually uh, making sense in the way we perceive the world around us so if I ask you what is the age relationship between someone who is 35 
and someone who is 30 years old, you will learn that the older person is 1.3 dB older. Okay, and now comes the funny thing. If I ask someone what is the age relationship between someone who is 20 and 15, okay? So maybe it has something to do with mating, like most things do. Uh, and in that case, you probably intuitively would say, especially if you're in this age bracket, uh, but even if you're not, that, you know, the difference between people who are 35 and 30 is quite a bit larger than the difference of, you know, people who are 20 and 15. And even more so if I take someone who is a seven year old and two years old, right? So you see that the difference of age in all these cases is five years, but actually it doesn't really express the core thing which we are trying to look at, which is the, you know, the kind of overall difference there. So actually when we express age of people, the difference is not the more most informative thing, but the dB scale is. You see, because 35 to 30, that's 1.3 dB older, and 20 to 15, it's 2.5 dB older. But 7 to 2 years old is actually 10 dB. Okay, so this is my little uh, example of, you know, how actually calculating dBs is really useful even in the situation when we typically don't use it. So, um, you know, if you, if you had a girlfriend... Uh, or a, a boyfriend who was five years younger at when you were 20, you can now calculate what should be the age difference once you're 35 uh, to maintain that ratio, whatever. I will let you have fun with that if you think that's fun at all. But this just goes to say that, uh, you know, hopefully uh, explains the DB thing a bit more. Cool. So. Now let's look at actual practice of attenuating signals. So typically linear scale is not great, but uh, exponential scale, no matter the fact that it's the dB scale and the more accurate one, is problematic because of the zero. Uh, because you will never yeah. get a real zero because actually in decibels you would need minus infinity to represent zero to actually mute the signal. So if you want to create a dial which controls the amplitude with a single mathematical expression uh, mapping the linear value 0 to 1 to uh, a, a decibel value to an actual exponential uh, range, you will have a problem. Um, so what a good solution is, is to use the cubic transfer because with this one, zero actually yields zero, right? So this is what we've seen, zero to one, the range is fixed, and then you can change the curvature. And actually what you can also do is you can change the exponent here if you think that this dial is not really doing what you would like it to do. Uh, so that's a hint, you know, use exponentiation to control the curvature. I typically would say, you know, I expect you to be creative uh, uh, people more so than engineers uh, who have to create reliable structures uh, that are accurate and, and all the rest. So typically, I would say, you know, just stick with your curvature because then you're much more flexible and you can change it and uh, you can make it, you know, sound the way you want it ultimately. And I think typically this is the this is the, um, the final thing. So here is just for uh, reference, this is how a cubed scale would look in decibels. Okay. So compared to an actual decibel scale, uh, it's slightly different and it might be for the better as well. I leave that to you. Okay, so progressing on from attenuation, uh, we look at panning which is initially everything to do with changing the amplitude of different uh, signals uh, with the relationship between them. So I'll just discuss amplitude-based panning here briefly. Uh, I have a, a psycho pan 
audio unit available under this link uh, which is actually built in super collider maybe i'll uh, pull it up for the exercises and this one uses multiple psychoacoustic cues i won't go into this there is a lecture online as well uh, with psychoacoustics where i talk in to about this in a bit more depth um so i will focus on the technical aspects of uh, amplitude panning here uh, this is the actual sketch typically panning you have a mono input you have two outputs and you have different gain values uh, available and the basic situation is what we call linear panning so typically you have a control zero to one it controls one of the channels and then you invert that value you do one minus that input value so one becomes zero zero becomes one and then you get this kind of transfer now there is an issue with this you actually perceive a dip in the middle the signal is louder here and louder here when they're far out and in the middle there is a dip and this has to do with the db scale uh, so what you do then instead is cosine law panning control so again uh, cosine law panning control is not a db accurate uh, control you could make a db accurate control but the r the issue with that is uh, typically that there is a very steep drop here so when you when you when you're at the extremes of left and right you would suddenly get a jump but then again you know you've seen uh, how to change curvature so i could even uh, suggest especially if it's a creative thing implement a panning control with a curvature with a variable curvature uh, but nevertheless a cosine law panning is typically the the thing that uh, people implement in digital systems uh, so you have an input range you invert it for different channels but then you also have this sine cosine uh, panning so what you're using there is the first quarter of the period of a sine wave between 0 and 1 and the first quarter of cosine wave between 1 and 0 so to speak uh, so I won't go into too much detail here if you want to implement this probably do an implementation in the exercises now with balancing it's a slightly different uh, situation because balancing means that you are inputting a stereo signal you have two channel input and two channel output so panning is mono to stereo balancing is stereo to stereo and here uh, the transfer is slightly different because typically in the center position of a balancing uh, process you want both channels to be full on right you don't want to be in in the middle with your balance spot and have a softer signal coming out compared to what came in so it is crucial that in the middle both left and right channels are full on the multiplier is one and then typically what you do is as you travel uh, to the right what happens is that the right signal does not change in amplitude but the left signal starts dropping and as you travel to the left the right uh, the left uh, signal doesn't uh, change in amplitude but the right signal starts dropping so actually you don't have a smooth uh, transfer here you actually have a, uh, a discrete threshold here and you use two functions okay so uh, hopefully that's clear and then we will do an implementation in the exercises to make it even more clear so that has everything to do with interaural time differences in terms of panning sorry level differences because you are changing the level the amplitude of the two signals coming in again all of this is in the psychoacoustics lecture look at that good so a few more basic things before we get on to modulation uh, multiplexing is actually switching whereby you have two inputs or multiple inputs in a single output here is how it looks like if you have a two channel switching typically you have one control that does two things just like I explained in the stereo processing this is multiplexing uh, and typical applications are phase inverter switch for example uh, 
as I said, when you invert, uh, when you multiply, actually, I didn't say this, I didn't talk about multiplying with negative values. But if you multiply with a negative value minus one, then you're essentially making every positive value negative and every negative value positive. So if you do that, you're inverting the phase. Um, and then the other way around is demultiplexing from one input to multiple outputs. We will look at these implementations in the exercises as well, just like the wet dry mix. So it's probably useful to have a glance at this briefly. If you have a process, you can control the wet and the dry signal separately. And then you can create a control which controls both, which is typically the wet dry ratio or mix. And in doing that, again, you can try to use a cosine law or you can try to uh, make a, a dry wet control with a parameter which is called the curve or anything similar. Great. So here we come to modulation, uh, which is essentially uh, automated control of a parameter, a kind of automated variation over time. Uh, basic sketch, something that you do by hand, you can do by another signal generator or another signal altogether. Uh, and obviously there is a range of potential uses here. I kind of expect you to be um, experimentally motivated in audio domain. Uh, and you probably know this already. Um, a few things that I want to highlight is that there is a crucial threshold at around 20 hertz, which makes the modulation inaudible in the sense that you don't hear a parameter value go up and down, but you hear it do something else. Uh, and typically this kind of threshold holds for everything. It holds for transition from pulse to pitch. It holds for transition between a still picture and a motion picture. So this is the typical rate at which we uh, our perception just does something. It cannot cope. It cannot discern uh, fixed separate values, but it blends them. Okay, so in, in terms of modulation, that will be quite crucial. Obviously, many different things you can modulate. Now, very often in creating modulation signals, you will need to create uh, a given range. So our scaling and offsetting bit uh, is crucial there. Uh, this is a brief sketch. Uh, I will uh, briefly explain it, I guess. Um, what I would uh, like to highlight here uh, is the easy way to do it in terms of um, conceiving it. I mean, first of all, most platforms do have uh, a built-in method to do range conversion where you specify the input range, you specify the output range, and it does it. Uh, but I think it's useful to, to, to figure this out. And typically, what I suggest is to consider the scale, the range first. Okay, because that has everything to do with growing the extent of the signal. So the, the suggestion here is first make sure that the size in terms of the range, the difference between maximum and minimum is appropriate. And then just offset it, then you can move it up and down, so to speak, to match the range that you're looking for. Um, shall we go into this? Um, well, let's do a brief example, okay? So let's say my uh, input range is 10 to 50 and my target range is 40 to 90, uh, 120, okay? So my suggestion is if you want to do this, I mean, obviously we can do, um, I won't go into too much uh, demonstration. If you want to do this, my suggestion is to first figure out the multiplier, M, and then figure out the adder. Okay, And then what will be the case is that if you take 10, multiply with M, and plus A, you should get 40. And if you take number 50, you multiply with M, add A, you should get 120. 
So that's the crucial thing that in this type of linear range conversion, uh, what you get is that if the boundaries work out, then everything in between works out as well. Okay, so the suggestion was first make sure that the range is fine. So the size of the signal. So what is the size of the input signal? That's 40. And what is the size of the output signal? That is 80. Okay, so if I want to double the size, which is the case currently, my multiplier is 2. And then you can take an intermediate range. So if I do 10 times 2, I get 20. So my adder has to be 20. And then you can verify this. If I do 50 times 2, I get 100. And if I add 20, I get 120. Okay, so this was a simple case with all integers in there, but I can be uh, trickier there. Let's take 10 to 55 and uh, 40 to 121. Uh, but the, the process is the same. So 55 minus 10, now it's 45. And 121 minus 40 is 81. So now if I want to figure out the multiplier, I have to calculate 81 by 45 which is 1.8. So my multiplier is 1.8. And then I can do the intermediate step. If I multiply 10 uh, with 1.8, I get 18. And this needs to be 40. So I do 40 minus 18, and I get 22. So my adder is 22. And then to verify that, what I need to do is take the intermediate steps here. So 55 times 1.8 is 99 and plus 22 is 121. So I actually get that range. Okay. Uh, great. And here are some examples about, of this. So uh, what happens with different scaling factors with different offset amounts. One thing that you uh, can uh, kind of figure out is that if you have a zero to positive value range, then and the, the, the target is also at zero minimum, then you don't need the offset. Uh, and there is a few more regularities, but I, I don't um, want to go into that uh, in too much detail. Uh, okay, combining modulators fairly straightforward. You can switch between them. You can blend between them. You can make a curvature of blending. That's kind of straightforward. I said already something about the modulation rates. Uh, and now let's get into the two basic things that we typically modulate. One is the amplitude and the other one is the frequency. AM, FM. <coughs> These terms come from uh, radio transmission. Uh, and it's a way of transposing an audio signal to much higher uh, s frequencies such that they can be transmitted in air uh, without us hearing them. If we were to hear these radio frequencies, we'd probably go mad because they're really congested by now. Uh, I won't go into uh, the cell damage from radio frequencies. Uh, it's a controversial topic. There is evidence of cell damage from radio frequencies. It all depends on the amplitude. You can actually make a lot of damage. So um, I'll leave that to uh, the experts and the conspiracy theorists. Um, so how, d how does this uh, initial radio transmission work? Maybe it's worth just saying something about this. Uh, so in terms of amplitude modulation, what you do is you have a very high frequency signal, much higher sig frequency than the audio signal. And then you use the audio signal to change the amplitude. Okay, so if you imagine an audio signal kind of going up and down, uh, what you have is a much higher frequency signal. And then the amplitude of that signal, the way it's louder and softer, uh, is used to encode the audio signal. 
so the audio signal in that case is called the modulation signal and the very high frequency signal is called the carrier signal and then once you'd have an antenna and it resonates at that extremely high frequency then you do use an amplitude follower to figure out what is the amplitude of that signal and you play that back and then you've demodulated your signal and obviously it's prone to a lot of noise uh, and it has a high noise floor because there are other disturbances that may cause the amplitude of this high frequency signal to be different at the receiver. Slightly more robust in terms of radio transmission is frequency modulation uh, because it doesn't depend on the amplitude of the carrier. So with frequency modulation what you have is that you have a band of very high frequencies. So with amplitude modulation you had a fixed frequency carrier signal. But here we have a band and actually the audio signal is encoded by changing the frequency of the signal in that band. So if it goes higher that corresponds to a high amplitude lower to low. So what that does it allows you to actually have a fixed amplitude carrier which means that your transmission uh, dynamic range is more stable. Okay, because if you catch the signal, if it's loud enough, then you know everything about it in order to decode it, and you don't you don't get a kind of a half uh, dynamic range in the transmission. Whereas if you are barely catching an amplitude modulated radio uh, frequency then you are compromising the dynamic range because the soft bits get lost, right? So it's a different way of encoding and it's slightly more robust. So that's where it all came from. They did radio transmission way before they did audio synthesis in terms of, you know, creating audio from uh, or worthwhile audio musical signals with signal generators. But these concepts are very useful and they translate. So typically amplitude modulation in musical terms is called tremolo. So when you change the amplitude of your signal as it plays, when you change the frequency, it's called vibrato. Uh, so typically uh, the two are linked. And unfortunately the terminology inherited is such that the tremolo bar on a guitar actually makes vibrato. Whereas if you uh, have a vibraphone, uh, then it does tremolo. I mean, a vibraphone, you know, it has fixed size uh, wooden bars, so no way the frequency is changing. It's, it's fairly fixed, but there is a mechanism whereby uh, the amplitude changes with these motors uh, rotating um, below the resonators. Uh, so it's a vibraphone is actually making a tremolo. There you go. Great, so let's look into some depth into amplitude modulation. So what you do here is you have a carrier signal and you change the amplitude, so a gain stage, a multiplier, with a slower rate modulator typically. If it's very slow, you get a tremolo. If it's higher, then you get something else, uh, which is an AM spectrum. Okay. Uh, so here is uh, another sketch of this, uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, here it is in terms of what it does to a waveform. Okay, So if you increase your modulation rate in a waveform, this looks like the cycles of the amplitude change becoming shorter. So increasing the modulation rate. If you increase the modulation depth, then you get that the difference of maximum amplitude and minimum amplitude is increasing but you see the duration of this cycle is fixed okay so in terms of creating a depth control for a tremolo effect uh, what you really want is this is now a, a sketch of range conversion right because we're interested in uh, what should be the multiplier and the adder here. I mean here's a sketch which shows you what the math is behind this. So the oscillation uh, will be centered around A0 which is your offset 
and the maximum value will be a0 plus the depth and the minimum value will be a0 minus the depth okay so that's typically what you get assuming that the oscillator outputs values between minus 1 and plus 1 which is typically the case uh, and then if you want to create um, depth control which acts the way you might expect it to which means that it adds more and more amplitude modulation without changing the signal amplitude so you want to create a, a tremolo control which does not affect the loudness of the signal and most of all it doesn't make it clip or anything like that so what this means is that in your modulator you want the top line to be fixed at one and this is crucial so if you have a zero modulation depth then you just want a signal which is fixed at value one and as you increase your modulation depth you want the peaks to stay at one but you kind of start growing the waveform from top to the bottom it kind of grows in this direction but the top is fixed right so if you have a fixed offset then growing the depth will actually make it grow both ways and that is a problem because if your offset is at one then you will start clipping as you increase the depth and if your offset is 0.5 then you will get an attenuator if your depth is zero so that's why it's crucial that the top of this waveform stays fixed at one and as the depth increases you grow it from there and it stays fixed at one okay so that's the challenge and here's the explanation how we tackle that challenge so this table here says it all so the oscillator minimum oscillator maximum so our input range is fixed minus one to plus one uh, my modulation my depth here uh, is 0 to 100 or 0 to 1 whatever you like so I'm looking at maximum modulation depth and I'm looking at no modulation and something in between uh, and then from this I can derive what my modulation modulator minimum and maximum need to be so as I said if I have no zero depth no modulation I want the modulator minimum to be plus one and the modulator maximum to also be plus one so I have a fixed plus one line I don't want to change in gain and as I increase the tremolo depth the modulator maximum stays at plus one but the minimum starts dropping and the maximum modulation will be when it drops to zero So this is the task we have. So you see it's a range conversion problem. We have input minimum and maximum. We have output minimum and maximum. And we are trying to figure out the scaling and the offset amount. Okay. And here it is. So if you want minus one plus one to map to plus one plus one, your scaling factor is zero and your offset is one because I multiply minus one times zero is zero, plus one is plus one, plus one times zero is zero, plus one is plus one okay now if i want half 50 percent uh, then my scaling factor is 0.25 because the input range is two and the output range is 0.5 so that's a quarter of that range so i multiply by 0.25 and then i do the intermediate step minus one I get minus 0.25 plus 1 I get 0.25 so in order to get to 0.5 and plus 1 I have to offset it by 0.75 and finally if I have a full modulation depth then my scaling factor is 0.5 and offset is 0.5 do the maths you will get this so actually these are the scaling factor and the offset amounts that I need as the tremolo depth grows in order to get this kind of neat uh, amplitude modulation depth control so the final thing here would be to again figure out what is the range conversion to go from 0 to 100 into 0 to 0.5 well that's an easy one you just divide by 20 and then 
to go from the depth control to the offset amount and you see here the range is inverted so actually the range is uh, you would have a 0.5 multiplier in this case uh, much less minus that and then do the offset so we'll do this in the exercises uh, but it's important to understand what is the point here cool so let's look briefly at the spectrum what happens actually as you amplitude modulate the signal you get sidebands so you have the carrier frequency and then you get a sum sideband carrier plus the modulator and you get the difference carrier minus the difference so this is something that you can verify something we will look at in the exercises if I have 1k sound I amplitude modulated with a 20 Hertz sine wave then I will get 1.02 and 9 what am I saying 980 120 Hertz sorry 1.2 kilohertz and 980 as well this is what happens in the spectrum so the the real interesting question is well wait a minute what if I just have a basic tremolo at 5 Hertz and I don't hear it as a more complex tone I just hear it as the amplitude going up and down at you know five times per second and the message is that technically they are also sidebands and that's the funny thing here if you have sideblends which are really close to e to the original frequency you don't hear it as a complex tone you hear it as a change in amplitude uh, and there is an equation in mathematics which expresses this the fact that adding sine waves has a way of being expressed in terms of multiplying sine waves so now you see that uh, if I do an amplitude modulation I'm actually multiplying two sine waves and I get something that I can express in terms of addition as well so this is really exciting but I, I won't go into those depths um, it will probably be more clear once we look at the practical side of these things uh, now combining multiple carriers oscillators you will actually get a set of uh, uh, partials there uh, this is a bit confusing right now because I believe this is an FM am I saying this right 50 100 what's going on here so uh, let's verify that in the exercises the point that I'm trying to get to is uh, the FM but first let's go to ring modulation so the main difference between amplitude modulation and ring modulation is that ring modulation is using bipolar modulators okay so you've seen with the amplitude modulations we had something between 0 and 1 at most but here we will have a bipolar signal going between negative and a positive value and in doing that uh, what you get is a really funny thing which we will again verify by looking at the spectrum you you actually remove the carrier frequency so with the ring modulator the only thing you get is the sidebands which is great and exciting and why well it's difficult to make this uh, very clear obviously if you're a mathematician you would present an equation and say well that's why um, but for a more intuitive understanding what you can think about is that when your modulator becomes negative you are inverting the phase okay and if you keep kind of inverting the phase there is something about phase cancellation uh, so you can kind of intuitively grasp that those kind of inversions actually uh, remove the original signal that's what happens uh, great as a matter of interest we have a process which is called single sideband modulation so if you look at this graph here uh, what we had is that amplitude modulation leaves the original signal and creates sidebands two of them based on the modulator frequency so if you increase the modulator frequency the distance of these sidebands increases 
with ring modulation you remove the carrier frequency so you're actually duplicating your signal once you duplicate it transpose down in frequency and once up and we have a process called single sideband modulation where you retain only one of these sidebands and this is actually a frequency shifter okay so there is a difference between pitch shifting and frequency shifting when you do frequency shifting all the components are moved by a fixed value so you can calculate the shift and with pitch shifting they are moved by a fixed ratio so instead of adding and subtracting you're actually multiplying and dividing okay so the pitch shifting preserves the harmonic relationship whereas the frequency shifting does not so if you have a harmonic sound you frequency shift it the harmonics won't be the harmonics of the fundamental they will still be overtones still be softer than the fundamental but the harmonic relationship the integer uh, relationship uh, will not hold okay so that's the difference between frequency shifting and pitch shifting and a single sideband modulation is actually frequency shifting and this is how you do it in supercollider there are a few Hilbert transforms recently in quarks uh, so you can you know create different qualities investigate that a bit but typically it's what we call quadrature processing so what you do is you split the original signal into the original the the, the real uh, signal and the imaginary signal which is a 90 degrees phase shift and then you have a modulator which is also shifted by 90 degrees so in this case cosine and sine wave so you modulate in the two dimensions so to speak so it's a kind of a complex number processing really you do working in complex domain so you modulate on one side and then on the other side you modulate with a phase offsetted modulator and then if you add these two together you will get one sideband if you subtract them you will get the other sideband so you can actually even control do you frequency shift up or down uh, quite exciting I think it should be among the exercises uh, to build frequency shifters uh, okay so that was amplitude modulation ring modulation and single sideband modulation all relied on changing the amplitude of the signal and now we look at frequency modulation which relies on changing the frequency you can read about the history Chowning didn't invent FM he appropriated it before you think uh, before you get carried away with sensationalism um, so this is the difference here so instead of using a modulator to change the amplitude we are actually interfering with the synthesis of this uh, sine wave by changing the frequency of it periodically so we use the modulator to change the frequency and in order to do that we again need scaling and offsetting uh, actually engineers prefer to call this process phase modulation because this is never a sine wave if you keep changing the frequency of it and if it's not a sine wave it doesn't have a s fixed frequency so to say that you're modulating something that never existed is funny from an uh, engineer's perspective. So typically the audio synthesis people use the frequency modulation term and the educated ones among those actually prefer the term phase modulation. Uh, for wider audiences I will retain the, phase, the frequency modulation term. And obviously the two can be equated, I won't go into details here but as i as i have said uh, you know to actually have a fixed frequency and to actually have a sine wave it has to go on forever as soon as you uh, shorten the sine wave the the, the spectral uh, uh, how should i say transform of that signal is not uh, and the narrowest possible peak okay so uh scaling and offsetting hello back again why well because we have to define a frequency value if we use this straight without the range conversion typically an oscillator goes between minus one and plus one 
so I would be changing the frequency of an oscillator between minus one hertz and plus one hertz uh, unlikely audible occurrence if you wanted to change between 200 and 300 hertz well that's exactly why we need these values so obviously I've explained uh, in some detail this process so I guess you can arbitrarily uh, create any range of modulation in this scenario uh, so we will go instead to describe a more powerful way of controlling an FM synth which has to do with parameters which are called index of modulation and harmonicity and first of all we're discussing index of modulation which is typically the amount of modulation and it controls the loudness of the sidebands so the more uh, modulation the louder the sidebands so how do the sidebands work in FM scenario uh, similar to AM except you have what we call higher order sidebands as well so not just the first order sum and difference but we have the second order the third order so you kind of keep multiplying with integers and you take all those things so what you have then is um, it's just a more complex spectrum um, and then the questions arise I <coughs> excuse me and then some questions will arise in terms of okay so what are the sidebands in terms of frequency well we have that spelled out and what are the amplitudes uh, which are also fully predictable <coughs> but it's not a very simple uh, prediction and it has to do with Bessel functions so we can look at this uh, briefly. Uh, these are your Bessel functions. So what you read here is the amplitude of different sidebands. So here is J0 is uh, the actual fundamental, or I should say the carrier frequency. Then J1 are the first order sidebands. Uh, J2, second order sidebands, third order sidebands, and so on. And these are plotted, so the amplitude of these components are plotted against the index of modulation, uh, which is the depth of modulation. You can think of it like that. Uh, so the amount, the, the amplitude of the modulator signal. And here is how they work out. As you increase the index of modulation, you see that, first of all, with zero index, you have only the carrier signal. So if the modulation depth is zero, it means there is no modulator, so you just get a clean sine wave, the clean carrier. And then as you keep increasing the modulation index, then the sidebands start coming up one by one. And as that happens, the amplitude of the carrier signal starts dropping and it actually reaches a zero value. So you can't have an FM synthesizer produce a lot of things except the carrier frequency. So at this stage you will see here J1 is fairly strong, J2 is fairly strong uh, and so on and so forth. Then you get the phase inverted carrier and then back again and you can follow it through uh, so actually there is a way to predict this and then you see if you have a, a kind of a high value uh, index it's a mess uh, but you can also think about this creatively let's say well I don't want uh, second order sidebands uh, so I can use this index of modulation again when it's zero here again here and so on uh, so there is a way of, to predict this if you want to dig into the math of Bessel functions, please do. Um, cool. So uh, that is about the amplitude of the sidebands. Now about the spread of the sidebands in frequency, well it's the same thing as with amplitude modulation. So if you increase the modulation frequency, they will spread out more. Okay, and the final thing we're gonna go into here is that spread and how it actually 
controls how harmonic your sound is, which means uh, whether there is a harmonic relationship between all those sidebands. And the thing is that if there is an integer relationship between the carrier frequency and the modulation frequencies, the ratio of these frequencies actually contributes to the harmonicity of the sounds. So what we do then is we define the harmonicity. I'm going to jump over uh, the feedback and actually that will be the last thing. Uh, because harmonicity becomes another parameter which internally controls the modulation frequency and the modulation amplitude in tandem with index of modulation. So instead of the low level parameters that determine the properties, the, the values that the oscillators run by, we have higher level parameters that are more useful, but actually they just control the underlying uh, oscillator parameters and the high level parameters are the index and the harmonicity and the reason why we use these typically is that they actually give us a fixed timbre across the pitch range so you can keep changing the carrier frequency and the spacing is uh, the same in terms of the harmonicity and the amplitude of the sidebands is also fixed Whereas if you have the underlying parameters fixed and you keep changing the carrier frequency, then the actual result in terms of the spectrum will change as you play a different pitch. So in terms of creating a synthesizer that kind of retains the timbre across the pitch range, you really need the index of modulation and the harmonicity. Okay? Uh, cool, uh, here is a sketch, will be part of the exercises, I took this from Max MSP Simple FM. Uh, this is how you figure it out. So carrier frequency becomes your pitch for the synthesizer. And then you have the harmonicity ratio and the modulation index, so you multiply these to get the modulation frequency, then you multiply that with modulation index to get the modulation amplitude. Okay, and then you add that to the carrier frequency to obtain the actual signal that controls the frequency of your carrier oscillator. So we will code this. And then finally, thing, another thing we will code, looks like it's going to be a huge um, uh, demonstration, is the feedback operators. Okay. So uh, Yamaha started with all this uh, FM for sound synthesis, thanks to Chowning. And for them, they used uh, the term operator to uh, define an oscillator. So operators are oscillators. And then typically you would have a scheme that shows you how the oscillators are connected, how many modulators, how many carriers. And then typically they allow for feedback schemes which means that the output of the oscillator is the controlling is controlling the input of the oscillator. Okay, uh, and this is extremely exciting. And this is something uh, we will look at in the exercises. But maybe let's just finish on a on an interesting note like this. Can we predict what's going to happen here? So you understand probably that changing the frequency of an oscillator will kind of change the time extent of a period. Uh, so if I increase the frequency of this oscillator, then the outgoing waveform will finish sooner. And if I decrease the frequency, it will finish later. So I kind of stretching and compressing it in time. Okay. And from that, you might be able to imagine what's going to happen if the actual waveform contributes to the frequency of that same waveform. In other words, contributes to the stretching and compression in time of that very waveform. Because what you expect then is that as the signal goes up, as it increases, I am increasing the frequency, which means I'm compressing it in time. And as it decreases, I'm extending it, 
I'm stretching it in time. And if the period of this stretching and compression is the same as the actual period of the waveform, this means, and obviously it's zero centered, this means that the amount of stretching and the amount of um, compression will even out. So actually you just get a kind of a waveform modulation because if I increase the frequency of this waveform in the first half, then it finished sooner. And I decrease the frequency in the second half, when then it will finish later, and these two, these two things will even out. So it kind of acts as compressing the first half of the waveform. Okay, so we will verify this. Obviously, in Super Collider, we will have to do a trick to have a single sample delay. And that thing actually causes issues. I believe we have been doing this in C++ in uh, previous um, teachings. And uh, there was an issue which we found a way to correct. Because of the one sample delay, things can go wrong. Uh, I mean, theoretically, this holds. But in a digital system, you don't have an actual feedback. So we'll see how we get on with that. Excellent. Well, thanks for your attention and um, see you soon. Goodbye.